Hello. All right. I want to tell you folks a story tonight about ride sharing from here in the city of Austin from roughly 10 years ago. Now, this is a topic that gets everyone a little bit heated, so bear with me for a minute here. I want to play a little game since we're in a gaming lounge. I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm going to tell you right now that at the very end of the story, there's a twist. And I want you to see if you can guess what this twist is. And I'll let you know right now, I'm going to be dropping a ton of hints. So don't worry. Um, this is a story that largely involves taxi regulators, government employees whose job it was to oversee the taxi industry. Now, fair warning here, I'm going to gloss over a lot. You can write entire encyclopedias about ride sharing. I've only got about 20 minutes to talk, so if there's details I'm not going to cover. My apologies in advance. Uh, one thing I want to state in advance, this is not a defense of Uber as a company. Uber was a highly unethical company. But I do believe that the product that they have, ride sharing, is superior to the taxi industry. I would argue it's roughly on par for the drivers and much, much, much better for the riders. So this is the culmination of a book I wrote in 2017 about a lot of these fights with taxi regulators. Uh, it was based on roughly 30 hours of first-hand interviews, uh, about 100 hours of online hearings and other media, uh, several hundred government emails. Government emails are public information. You can request them at any time. And about 1,000 pages of news articles. And I'll give you a hint of what I'm going to focus on tonight. This is a rough timeline of ride sharing. It starts roughly in 2010 when Uber launches in San Francisco. You might remember in 2016, we had that fight with Uber and Lyft and the city council, and then they left us for a year. The period I'm going to be focusing on is a much less known period from 2012 to 2013. And it's largely going to be focusing on three characters. So on the very left is Carlton Thomas. He was Austin's chief taxi regulator during this time. In the middle is Ed Cargbo. He was the president of the local yellow cab company. And on the right is an attorney named Matt Doss. He was president of the International Association of Transportation Regulators, essentially a taxi regulators association of which Carlton Thomas was a member. So these are the three people I want you to focus on tonight. So real quick, let me give you a little bit of background about how taxis were regulated in this country. Taxis were regulated very much like a public utility. Their prices were strictly controlled by law, and in most cities, there were only a certain number of cabs you were allowed to have on the streets. Also, it was very, very difficult to become a cab company because they only let so many onto the streets to begin with. Having a local oligopoly of cab companies was very, very common in most cities. For the drivers, the drivers used to be employees back in the 1970s of cab companies. They would earn a 40-60 split off of fares. But then in the 80s, they were converted into independent contractors. And what this meant was they had to pay a fee every week for the privilege of driving a cab, and then they would earn enough fares to offset that fee and make a living. So in the city of Austin, for instance, if you were a yellow cab driver in 2014 or so, you had to pay $300 a week for the privilege of driving a cab and then try and earn enough fares on top of that to take home a living. Um, what this generally meant was that the cab companies had shifted all the risk onto the drivers and had earned money up front and in advance. It was the driver's responsibility to take the risk on behalf of the industry. But the way the drivers responded is they kind of gamed this industry. They would look for ways to stick around certain areas. They mostly stuck around like airports, hotels, downtown centers, because they wanted to avoid going into far off areas where they wouldn't get a return ride. Generally, this meant that we had a very bad problem with cabs in this country. So, for instance, in 2007, in San Francisco, they did a study on taxi cabs, and they found that 50% of the dispatch calls were no-shows. It was even more in certain areas of town. And mind you, San Francisco is like 46 square miles. They have one of the largest taxi fleets in America. This is like one-sixth the size of Austin, and even they had huge problems with taxis getting to where they needed to be. The point I want to make to you tonight is that no matter how badly this system functioned, taxi regulators saw it as their sacred duty to protect this industry from any outside competition. They saw themselves as like guardians of this industry. So in the early days of Uber, they were not into ride sharing. They were into what was called black car service. Black cars were like luxury sedans. Their drivers were professionally licensed chauffeurs, 
and they kind of operated in this legally ambiguous area called prearrangement. So legally, taxis had the exclusive right to pick up street hails, but sedans could compete on what was called prearrangement. They could compete on a dispatch service. Because back in the day, what sedans did was they just sat in an office by a phone, waiting for someone to call and essentially schedule a ride. They could do this legally through what was called prearrangement. But here's the thing. The buffer between the time that a ride was requested and the, and the time they arrived was rarely, if ever, defined in most cities. Was it an hour? Was it half an hour? 15 minutes? 10 minutes? Five? Uber exploited this loophole and gave a bunch of black car drivers an iPhone 4, brand new at the time, and said, here, take this. Use our app, put your cars on the street, and you'll make a ton of money. And they did. By the end of 2012, they had expanded to roughly a dozen cities in the United States. You might see on that map that the closest one to us was in Dallas. And despite making use of this loophole, pretty much every taxi regulator told them no, 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 no. They were sent cease and desist letters like crazy. They were, uh, their cars were impounded. There were sting operations. In a lot of cities, they tried to change the regulations to close this loophole. Really, the only cities that tolerated them at first were New York and Seattle. Seattle, I, I talked to their regulator, they were kind of overburdened with other responsibilities. And New York had like 11,000 cabs on the street. They didn't really see Uber as a big competitor to 11,000 cabs. But everywhere else, they said, eh, we don't really like what you're doing. And even here in Austin, here's an email from Ed Cargbo where he, called, where he talks to Carlton Thomas, and he's talking about an article where Uber is in Dallas. And in the article, Uber says they want to expand to other cities like Austin. Cargbo sees the article, he forwards it, and he says, hey, um, I wanted to share this with you and ask if it's possible to get the city's legal department to write a letter letting Uber know that they'd be operating illegally in Austin. So this is the kind of relationship that regulators and the taxi industry had. Now, in the middle of these fights, in the summer of 2012, things start to change. There are three major uh, uh, companies that are in the ride-sharing space that start to spring up roughly at the same time. You probably know of Lyft in San Francisco. There's another one called Sidecar, also in San Francisco. And there's our very own homegrown Hayride here in Austin. So the way they tried to operate was through this very legal, uh, legally dubious area of what they termed ride-sharing. It's where the term comes from. Ride-sharing is essentially an extension of carpooling. The way they tried to reason it was, hey, you know, maybe on my way to work, I'm 20 miles away from work, I'm gonna pick up someone along the way who's kind of along my path, and I'll give them a ride and they'll pay me a fare. Ride sharing. Except, uh, traditional carpooling is non-profit. So it wasn't really an argument that many people bought, it was very much legally dubious. But then again, with the regulator community like it was, the only other option was to say, well, we see a lot of bad service in the taxi industry, we wanna see if we can fill those holes, which is what Hayride did. So Hayride launches in 2012, and very quickly they get a cease and desist just a few months later here in Austin. Um, at first they ignore it, and the local yellow cab company starts to get very nervous about this and starts to send information to Carlton Thomas about their service. He's uh, sending them information about, you know, drivers. They even commission a private investigator to go out and take a bunch of rides and report back. And that's what this is. It's a private investigator's report from the yellow cab company saying, hey, here's the number of rides we took, here are the drivers we encountered, license plate numbers. They start to give physical descriptions of the drivers and so on and so forth. About a month later, the cease and desist order becomes public information. And the owner of Hayride believes that the Austin Transportation Department was pressured by the taxi industry to go after them. As evidence, he points to a tweet he got where he was shown a copy of the cease and desist order before it became news. In other words, a cab driver had it, sent it to him before it became widely known. Now, let me change gears a bit. Let me come back to this, Uber's black car service. At the center of a lot of these fights was this guy, Matt Doss. He's the former NYC taxi regulator under Bloomberg and Giuliani, and when he leaves, he becomes an attorney at Wendell's Marks Lane and Middendorf, a law firm in New York. He becomes a distinguished lecturer in New York, the City University of New York, and he becomes president of the IATR. And he decides to draft a white paper called Rogue Smartphone Applications, Innovation or Unfair Competition. Spoiler alert, he thinks it's unfair competition. 
He basically goes through a laundry list of all the ways that apps, predominantly Uber, are not complying with standard taxicab regulations. And this becomes a very popular paper in regulatory circles. In fact, Ed Cargbo himself sends a copy over to Carlton Thomas saying, hey, this is the best work to date on rogue apps, as we discussed the other day. I'll continue to share information with you as I get any. Matt Doss says he authored this paper because of growing concerns and emails he was getting from regulators. And he decides he wants to form an app committee to create model regulations, the purpose of which is to take regulations that you know, the regulators themselves can take to their local cities and say, here, we should implement these. And throughout 2012, they start to have a few meetings. And one of the things I noticed was, in one of their meetings, they talk about the role of the TLPA. And I'll tell you who that is in a second. But Doss says he is convinced the TLPA, that regulators are not the concern for the industry. They just want to create rules that will prohibit unlicensed activity. The TLPA is the Taxi Cab Limousine and Paratransit Association of America. It's the largest association of taxi cab companies in the United States. And Doss here is saying, when we start to create these regulations, we're not going to hurt your industry. That's not the purpose of them. It's to prohibit unlicensed activity. So they start to draft the model regulations, and as you can kind of imagine, you're probably not surprised at this point, it's things like they want a minimum of 30 minutes for prearrangement. In other words, if you use Uber's black car service, they can't arrive within 30 minutes of being summoned. Other provisions are things like they cannot use GPS to calculate distance. You have to remember back in the day, Uber used to use time and distance to calculate your fare. Also, they wanted a minimum fare that was going to be set higher than an average taxi cab fare. So basically, this is just a way of shutting out Uber's black car service. These model regulations get presented at an annual conference in 2012, and Carlton Thomas is there. He's on a panel of IATR members where they're talking about this, and he says, we support the model regulations and look forward to implementation. Now, can you guess who else was in the audience? Ed Cargbo. And the reason I know that is because I've seen the attendee registration list. He was there watching, as were many other cab companies, but he was there too. Now, this was in November in 2012, and by January, things started to get even crazier. California. The California Public Utilities Commission is the regulator for all non-taxi private transportation in California. Things like private buses, limousines, limos, pretty much everything that's not a taxi. They had issued $20,000 fines to Uber, Lyft, and Sidecar, but the point of the fines was not to stop their service. It was to get their attention and bring them in and say, hey, we want to bring you under a regulatory framework in which you can survive. And they make a deal with all these companies. They say, okay, as long as you meet certain basic guidelines, we will continue to let you operate and we'll rescind the fines. During this, Uber says it's gonna consider entering the ride-sharing market. They put in a little provision in their agreement that basically says, they might start using non-chauffeur drivers. Sidecar freaks out. Sidecar is looking at Uber and Lyft and going, oh my God, we've got all these competitors now. We need to make a move. And their move is they're going to expand across the United States. And the way they do that is they move into three markets. They buy out Hayride here in Austin. They launch in Philadelphia and New York. They say that they're planning to be fully operational in time for South By. Uh, they say they've gotten assurances from Austin and Philadelphia that their cars are not going to be impounded. But look at the date of this. It's uh, February 14th, 2013, Valentine's Day. The next day, Austin Transportation Department says, no, 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 no. Cease and desist, cease and desist, cease and desist. And this is kind of the response they get everywhere. Uh, New York kicks them out very, very fast. Philadelphia starts issuing citations. So what Sidecar does is they adjust. They're like, okay, look. How about this? We'll create an ambassador program in which we will pay drivers to go around and give away free rides so we can build brand awareness. Philadelphia and Austin are like, well, there's no law against giving away free rides. If you want to lose money doing that, have at it. And that's what they begin to do. Meanwhile, Carlton Thomas goes to work. He goes to a subcommittee of the Austin City Council called the Urban Transportation Committee, and he starts uh, recommending a lot of different provisions. The first of which is that they're gonna start impounding cars that are uh, giving away taxi-like service during South By. And he asks for basically emergency powers for the uh, Austin Police Department to start doing so. He says here, you know, they've been identified as a concern from limo, taxi, and charter vehicle stakeholders. And the Austin City Council says, oh, sure, fine, go ahead, impound cars. 
A month later, uh, something strange also starts to happen. There is a city council member named Chris Riley who uh, proposes a, a uh, resolution essentially asking for a report on the state of ride sharing in this country and a recommendation for an ordinance. And it has a lot of kind of flowery pro ride sharing language, you know, uh, whereas Austin is continually exploring innovative transportation solutions and ride sharing may be a sustainable and sufficient peer-to-peer uh, -peer transportation option. It's being promoted nationally. In other words, it's sending a very pro ride sharing signal. But guess whose job it is to come up with a report on the state of ride sharing in this country. Carlton Thomas. <laughs> so now he's got three tasks ahead of him. He has, to say, he has to ask himself, okay, what am I gonna do about Uber's black car service? I've gotta write a report on the state of commercial ride sharing across the country, and I've gotta make a recommendation for a ride sharing ordinance. So he goes to work. He goes back to the Urban Transportation Commission and he starts with Uber's black car service. He uh, offers, among several other things, a provision that says the prearranged basis for black car sedans is going to be at least one hour. The Austin City Council takes it and says, oh, make it half an hour, but sure, fine. There's not even really much discussion about it. Then later in another meeting, Matt Doss is supposed to show up and give a presentation called Going My Way, the proliferation of, trans of rogue transportation services. But he gets sick. And who takes his place at the last minute? Well, not anyone from his law firm, Ed Cargbo. Ed Cargbo comes in and takes the exact same PowerPoint presentation and gives it on his behalf. This is interesting to me. This is supposed to be an expert taxi regulator giving his expert opinion about the state of taxi services or taxi regulations and ride sharing, and instead it gets deferred to a local president of a yellow cab company. That's very odd to me. Cargbo goes to work and he emails uh, everyone he can think of who already hates ride sharing, basically a bunch of other taxi regulators across the country who don't like Uber, who don't like ride sharing, and says, tell me the state of ride sharing in your jurisdiction. Matt Doss replies back, hey, don't worry about it. I'm drafting a report on this. I got you, buddy. What's your time frame? Matt Doss also starts to send around a, uh, in a model ordinance of what the ride sharing law should look like. Um, and he comes up with this. And he basically says, if there is a for-profit motive, it needs to be considered for hire transportation and such laws are applicable. In other words, it has to be like a traditional taxi service or it cannot exist if it's for profit. Good luck with becoming a traditional taxi service. He sends a report to the Austin City Council saying, you know, here's a bunch of safety concerns you need to be aware of. And Sidecar at this point is starting to hit a wall. So by this point, they've tried offering free ambassador programs They've tried suing the city of Austin. It didn't go anywhere. The suit got thrown out. They've tried social media campaigns, but they don't go anywhere. They don't really have the cachet of like Uber or Lyft. And then they propose a pilot program, basically what it sounds like that says, hey, maybe just let us operate on an interim basis and we can see where we go from there. Carlton Thomas releases his report and it is one of the most one-sided reports I've ever seen among a government regulator. It mentions Uber for reasons I really don't understand. Uber hadn't even entered Austin by this point. They were only just starting to get into ride sharing, and yet they felt the need to mention it. This is mostly a fight about sidecar and whether sidecar can stay in Austin, and yet he's starting to mention other ride sharing companies. He said in an early version, an early draft, only in California is there confusion related to the entry of smartphone dispatch applications. And then this is the part I like. He starts to talk about how the LA taxi regulator uh, went after these services, issued cease and desist orders, and the companies were advised that failure to comply is a misdemeanor and they can be subject to criminal prosecution. Here's the part he's leaving out. The mayor of Los Angeles told their taxi regulator to shut the hell up. The mayor of Los Angeles wanted these services, yet he conveniently leaves that part out of the report. He also starts to show a lot of the citations that were given out mostly during South by Southwest this year, that year. Um, he doesn't say in the report which companies these were ascribed to. One you might notice there is that there's a driver who got pulled over who had a breathalyzer activated ignition. Uh, not a good look for ride sharing, but all of this gets pinged to sidecar, except I happened to pull that citation. It was an Uber driver. It was an Uber driver because at the time, Uber was beta testing their ride-sharing app during South by Southwest. They hadn't really formally entered Austin, but they were beta, t beta testing the app. Ultimately, Carlton Thomas says, hey, we don't really want to do a pilot program. We just don't see a viable way forward. And they put through the ride-sharing provision that he more or less wanted, saying ride-sharing has to be considered a non-profit activity. 
So after this sidecar folds up tent, they retreat back to the West Coast. They spent a painful amount of money on their ambassador program, and they basically go out of business two years later. After this winds up, everyone on the IATR starts shaking each other's hands, saying congratulations to those who assist assisted in drafting the rideshare report. Special congratulations to App Committee member Carlton Thomas of the Austin Transportation Department, who was integral in pushing in this new rule through. And the following year, he gets an award for IATR Regulator of the Year. <laughs> All right, I mentioned a twist. Maybe you can guess what it is. I want to come back to this person. Can you guess why I've been talking about him a lot? He's an attorney. Can you guess who one of his clients was? The Taxi Cab Limousine and Paratransit Association. And I'm not speculating. I know this because I've seen the emails. A member of the TLPA emailed their Connecticut regulator and said, hey, his law firm has been retained by the TLPA to combat the rogue app companies on behalf of the taxi and livery industries. And I also found this, some work product. Now, you might notice it says privileged and confidential, and you might be going, Connor, how did you get that? Well, I'll tell you. A member of the TLPA was quite dumb enough to email this to a government regulator at their government email address. And when you, and when you do that, it doesn't really matter how many times you stamp confidential on it, it's a public document now. And you can see here it says, Matt Doss's law firm has been retained by outside, as outside counsel by the TLPA. And in this report, they even mention the battle that was going on in Austin, which I've just described to you. So let me bring this back to the food chain here of how this is all operating. The taxi industry goes to Matthew Doss, who uses his resources as an attorney with Windows Marks and his expertise as a president of the IATR to ask folks like Ed Cargbo and Carlton Thomas to put forth new regulations that benefit them. This is effectively a front for pro-taxi industry uh, interests. The IATR pretending to be, uh, claiming to be that they're there for taxi regulators is really there for taxi cab company interests. Now, I want to be clear about one point here. Carlton Thomas was not a puppet of Matthew Doss. He was not his lackey or anything. It's just that Matthew Doss was very happy to provide resources, and Carlton Thomas was very, very happy to take them because he ultimately wanted to keep control over this industry. But this is a monumental conflict of interest, in my opinion, that to date I've not seen any taxi regulator held to account. So. This is a dirty phrase that's used in regulatory circles, but it's absolutely true, in my opinion, of the taxi industry. Regulatory capture. And what this means is when a regulator starts to empathize more with the industry that they regulate than their constituency. They were very, very eager to keep control over this industry. A lot of people assume it has something to do with money. I disagree with that notion. I do really think it's about control. Now, I want to be fair here. I did gloss over some stuff. I'm sorry about that. Um, a few things I want to be, I'll mention to be fair. There were a lot of gaps with the ride-sharing industry during this time. Uh, one is the disability community. The disability community is very reliant on taxis, and ride-sharing was not getting around to addressing that anytime soon. Another was insurance. There were gaps in insurance in ride-sharing that had not been addressed and wouldn't be until 2015. Another was uh, background checks. This is a very sticky can of worms that had also not really been addressed very well. But at any time, the regulators could have done what the California PUC had done and given permission to provide, you know, allow them to operate on an interim basis as long as they met or improved certain safety concerns over time. And I want to reiterate here, Uber knew a lot of what I've told you tonight. They did their own research on the IATR and found not everything, but a lot of what I had already found. They kind of understood where their interests were. And if you're Uber and you come to a city like Austin and the big fight in Austin is over background checks in 2015, how do you trust the city of Austin to do your background checks when that responsibility is going to fall, is going to fall probably to Carlton Thomas's office, a person who does not want your business to survive in the first place? And the point I want to make here again is that this is not an angels versus demons story. Uber was not the angels and the regulators the demons. What I'm trying to say is that taxi regulators should have been the honest brokers in this fight, and they absolutely were not. They were trusted as the experts in this fight, yet they had a severe pro-taxi bias. I think I've gone way over time. <laughs> if you enjoyed this story, I've got like a dozen others from this, uh, from my book. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Connor. That was great. So who has questions? All right. I saw a hand come up finally from that middle section that we've been waiting for for so long. Jacob, you can keep the camera wherever you want it. I don't know. What's your question? Keep them tight. So my question is, have you kept up with the yellow cab industry? Like, are they still in operation? And if they are in operation, do you know why? Are yellow cabs still in operation? They are, in still, they are still in operation. Uh, I, I truly don't know why. I'll be honest with you. After I wrote my book in 2017, I had to go find a real job. Uh, so I, <laughs> I wanted to get back to having a life. So I didn't really keep up with a lot of this. I did see a lot of yellow cab companies went out of business. Uh, the one in Houston declared bankruptcy, I think just this last year, and sold themselves to a taxi app. Uh, why are they still in I honestly don't know. Uh, sometimes they're there when you need them. They're there when you need them at an airport, certainly, but if you have, I don't have a good guess to that, sorry. That's a deflating answer and I apologize. It's just, I, I honestly don't know. All right, we're off to a good start, and we're going to go over here again. Just heading in the same direction, slightly deeper into the crowd. What you got? Uh, so you've probably seen how, like, with Tesla and some of these other companies that are making self-driving, which is in many ways an alternative to taxi services, there's been all sorts of weird sorts of things happening in the world of politics. I'm curious if you smell, if there's any smell of that to you, of some suspicious, you know, political magic going on there. Self-driving cars, the next threat, question mark. Tesla is a weird bird because Tesla likes to make a lot of promises that Tesla can't really keep. <laughs> I don't smell any big regulatory fights. There have been some about whether or not it's safe, whether or not the technology can be trusted, but I don't really sense that the taxi industry has done much to stop them or even really the ride-sharing industry. To me, it feels fairly clean cut, but if I started to dig into it and look at emails, who knows, maybe I'd find something interesting. All right, so I think we have one question and one more, one more in this general direction, and we'll figure it out, and yeah. So, you wanna meet me halfway, or should I? <laughs> Very fascinating talk. I actually remember our meetup group having vigorous debates about kitchens proposals around rideshare regulation. So, uh, yeah, blast in the past. Um, Curious if you see similar regulatory shenanigans on the horizon related to the um, no middleman rideshare community Runner City, which is about to launch their own ride sharing app very shortly. Runner City, question mark? I don't know what Runner City is. I'm <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, no, I've, I've not smelled anything on the horizon, but again, you know, I, ha I kind of had to abandon this topic in 2017 and move on to other things. But uh, uh, no, I haven't, but I mean, that sounds fascinating. I can tell you that in the middle of the fight with Kitchen, Kitchen was quietly supporting another app called Get Me. She didn't come out publicly for it, but I've got a bunch of emails showing that she was trying to prop up the company and show it as an example of an app that could exist under the regulatory framework that they had envisioned. So, you know, invite me back for that story. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to head off in this general direction. I want to go deeper in, and then we're going to end up with you. All right. Just, just running all over the place tonight. Is there anywhere in the world that has done it right? Like, where can we look for inspiration? Where can we find good examples of ride-sharing regulatory interactions? Um, I would, honestly, I would defer back to California in the example I showed you. It was really the only group of regulators in the country that was willing to go out on a limb and say, we're going to try this out. Uh, across the world, I mean, in my opinion, taxis are kind of better in other countries than they have been in America. I don't know why. Maybe that's a bias. On, that's probably a bias on my part. But you have to understand, Uber... <laughs> They're so unethical. Like, it just came out last month, uh, text messages from the CEO, Travis Kalanick. He was talking about uh, taxi drivers in other countries getting into fist fights with Uber drivers, and he was wanting to use that as political leverage and say, this is another reason why we need to be allowed to operate. Uber was really, really an awful company. So when you're asking me, and they're, and they're really the ones who led the charge internationally far more than Lyft did, 
So when you're asking me if there's another country that did this right, I mean, no, because there's bad actors on both sides. And that's the problem with this fight. It needs an honest broker, and aside from the California PUC, I could seldom find one. All right, we have time for one more question. So you're going to bring us home. You're going to give us a good one. All right? No pressure. All uh right. -huh. So the, uh, the biggest objection I've heard to, uh, so far to Uber and, and other rideshare uh, programs like that is that the, uh, the drivers uh, do not carry commercial insurance. They only carry personal insurance, which, if my understanding is correct, is no good if they get into an accident while doing a rideshare. Uh, has any, has there been any real movement on that or, or any proposed solutions to that problem? Insurance, question mark. Yeah, so to give you a little bit more context, uh, the big concern that they had was whether or not any kind of insurance would apply, whether it was like, you know, Uber's excess policy insurance or personal insurance. During the period when like you've got the app open but you don't have like a passenger with you, you're not on the way to pick up a passenger, is that you just driving around or is that a commercial operation? No one really had a good answer to this. And there was a, this was actually a big fight in Colorado in 2014. Colorado was on its way to becoming one of the first states where the legislature would legalize this service. And they didn't have a good answer for this. And they told Uber, like, look, you need to figure this out. So Uber sat down with the insurance industry in 2015. And basically, I think what they came up with was a rider that you could attach to a personal insurance policy. And as I recall, I believe it was in 2015 that the Texas legislature codified that into law as an option. So they've at least found a way to plug the holes, I honestly don't know how well it's been tested, and you might have a valid point that it's still not sufficient. But it's at least, there's at least been proposals made that would allow it, uh, insurance to take effect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Connor. That was great.